Hey, I tell you, it's great to be here. I mean, we're here for you. We're here because of you. Now, we know that every pixel matters, and when it comes to the upgrades you need for inside your systems, like the new Oros for the, the MacBook Airs and the MacBook Pro Retinas that you know, take those 2013 and later machines forward, you, know, you need options. You need to be able to take your technology further. You need to be able to take your creativity further. And storage, you know, external storage, now, yesterday, you know, yesteryear, 500 gigabytes was a lot. 500 megabytes used to be a lot. And now we're talking 32 terabytes and way beyond. Now, it's my privilege to introduce Lewis of 30 Ninjas. He's their VR dude and CTO. He's going to talk about some serious storage needs and some really cool stuff. And Chris, our enterprise storage dude, now, he's, he's got solutions to go way beyond 32 terabytes. You either think 32 or 40 terabytes or 64 terabytes is a lot today. You know, just wait to what you're going to need tomorrow. <laughs> but, we, but we got you covered. So enjoy and, and thank you. Thank you. Hey, Super Meat, how are you? It's great to be here. I'm also excited that my new title is VR Dude. Um, it's pretty awesome. So, I shoot VR. It's the white hot new thing. Sorry, Ryan. Ryan Whitehead, wherever you are. Um, anyway, so the first thing I'm going to do, because everybody is asking everyone, how do you edit VR? How do you tell stories in VR? Da -da 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 -da. I'm just going to show you right away. It's going to be really, really easy. Um, here we go, if this works. So, can you play that video? This is how you tell stories in VR. So now, I'm sorry. It's vertical, it's 2016, let's just get over it. So, laser pointer, cat. But then you have a cut. Oh, and I'm talking as well, apparently, on this video, I apologize. But if you keep your laser pointer here, in view. So watch. I just cut. They pick right up. I'm going to cut again in a second. But if you cut incorrectly behind them, allow your user, you, your user to track. And that, if we can stop that video, is how you cut in VR. You're welcome. Um, Actually, not the end of my presentation, but um, seriously, everybody's telling you that there's all these rules and there's all these, like, this is the right way to do it. Um, haven't apparently ever read a film history book because everybody said the same thing to Lumiere. Everybody said the same thing to Eisenstein, Murnau, Lang. Oh, the train's coming in the tunnel. It'll scare the audience. Or, oh, no, if you cut between the two scenes, people will just get confused. No. Just don't bore people and pay attention to where you think your audience is looking. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe they're not looking there, but watch other people watch your work and you'll figure that out. In the same way with the cat, if I move the laser pointer in front of the cat and I start it in a place where she can see, that's Lola, by the way, she follows the laser pointer. If I point it behind her, she doesn't. She gets bored and walks away. Well, she in this case, she didn't walk away. But in the other video, she uh, started cleaning herself. So, um, next slide. So, I'm here to talk about something that actually does have rules and is really daunting and somewhat terrifying in VR. Um, VR cameras are all made of lots of little cameras, which inherently means more data to manage, more data to store, more problems. Also, when you consider that if you're making VR content for a headset, you're dealing with two eyes, you're hopefully dealing with stereo, and when you look at some of the resolution that's required for some of these headsets, particularly, keep, particularly to keep it future compatible and to help you have a legacy-based medium, you're going to have to be rendering out in incredibly high resolution, usually about 8K, or, oh, sorry, and 60 frames a second. That's to make sure there's a good user experience. So, the next problem about problem with that is most places where you shoot VR are not places that are good for hard drives. I do have a reputation for breaking hard drives and breaking computers because I do things like dump data on a boat and then pour water on it because I took my wetsuit off or, you know, this was the one in the, the photo on the right or I think, yeah, on the right, uh, chicken guts fell into a hard drive I had on set and... That was gross, and it broke. 
um, but I took the back off and replaced it. Um, on the left is shooting sharks, as you can see. So these are places where you're shooting in super volatile scenarios where you need to have redundancy because, I mean, I'm a diver and I've always been taught that three is actually two and two is actually one and one is actually zero. So in a place like that, you really want to capture that shot because that shot is awesome. If I lost just one camera, now I've got this big black hole in the image. So what do I do? I don't completely know. We thought about going to a tape-based workflow because that's incredibly cheap and very, very strong and it's not difficult, it's very difficult to break, but it's also incredibly time consuming. So I didn't want to do that. Um, so we talked about dumping to multiple drives. That takes a long time. It's fairly cheap. If you dump to bare drives, it works out well. But it's also time consuming and I'm also sort of paranoid and have a hard drive that I want to leave in LA and a, a duplicate of that in New York and then, you know, if there is a nuclear attack, like, they're going to take out New York and LA, so I need to have it in some place like Winnipeg as well. <laughs> um, anyway, so here's a picture of... This is, again, another great part about capturing VR is you have to hide and sometimes you're in a place where you might get your camera stolen. So you hide underneath it and have your post house complain when they, you tell them you need to be painted out. Um, this on the right is an example of some of the SD cards. Notice I say some of the SD cards off of a rig I've worked with. On the left is one of my drawers that broke from the weight of all the hard drives in there. <laughs> um, you also have, I also have a situation, so I'm working on a project, it's called Invisible. It's a 30 minute high action narrative VR series. It's insane, it's crazy. It's produced by Samsung, Jaunt, Condé Nast, and my company, 30 Ninjas, with the director, Doug Lyman. You've probably seen his film, Born Identity, or Edge of Tomorrow. It's insane, it's super high action. It's actually really fun to watch. That's something we've been really careful to do, is like, was, is it fun? Do I wanna watch it? Am I bored watching it? Yeah, okay, well then let's cut that part and put something else in. Um, but, it's incredibly high-end, but the way you capture and the way you store is really problematic. Also, to top it off, I have a director who's in LA one day, who's in London the next day, who's in New York the next day, and I'm having to chase him with edits, and I'm having to bring to my post house the molecule in New York City to do the VFX, and then I have a color house in LA, and my partner's in LA. It's really exhausting. And then also, when I'm, you're dealing with a camera that's shooting, you know, we're at 4K, we're roughly 60 gigs a minute, and then if you want to conform in 8K, which is a good idea, you know, you're at 120, something like that, per minute, which is fun when you start doing the math on that and you start shooting, and it really adds up really, really, really fast. I should say, if anybody has questions about any of this stuff, please stop me. Um, so, this is another picture of us. This is us working in Haiti, uh, this, is an, uh, this is a small shot inside of uh, one of the shanty towns there. We were shooting narrative just last week up there. Uh, so one of the solutions I had, we have these Thunder Bays that are, that are pretty great. They're, they're really strong. I like them because you can take the back off of them when you pour things inside of them or when sand gets into them and then you replace the part and you're fine. It's very, very easy. The tool that I need to do that is on my Leatherman. Same with these little shuttle drives. We were using these one terabyte shuttle drives to run drives in between different people. And also have something that could be easily put into a jacket if I'm flying through multiple customs where they get confused by a raid and then I forget the raid keys and they threaten to confiscate it because I can't open up the raid. Um, so you've got, you've got these one terabyte drives. But this is again, this is starting to spread out. How do we, how do we keep track of all that? How do we how do? We do this? Um, it's, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of, a lot of enterprise solutions that we're ultimately going to be looking towards. So, I'm going to start talking with Chris here. Chris is a good friend of mine. I don't work for OWC, but I'm told he has some amazing solutions for this problem where I'm having to run with multiple partners in multiple cities, lots and lots of data, and, you know, looking to do a conform that's 60 frames a second and 8K for 30 minutes long, but that's not the VFX layers. Obviously with a VFX movie, you have multiple layers on a timeline. So really, it's probably like 60 minutes. Chris? <laughs> yes, so. Um, <laughs> How do you help me? 
a lot of these struggles that you're kind of encountering right now um, are the reasons why we started developing our Jupiter product line. Um, we wanted to really provide a, a super high performance, um, scalable, but affordable storage system, uh, or systems I should say, that, that really lets you um, kind of grow as you need to with, without um, having to really worry about your storage um, and have it to, to track where you put this drive on the shelf or where you put this one in this drawer. We really wanted to, to enable you to be able to centralize everything in one spot, um, have the capability to push it to other locations even, uh, which is something you need to do. Yes. Right? From New York to so LA. New York, it? London, yeah. or LA, mm -hmm. or potentially the Middle East, depending upon where my director is at the time. Yeah. yeah. So um, we're actually demoing at our booth. We have a Jupiter Callisto system set up, which is, uh, uh, again, highly scalable. We use ZFS inside, has 10 gig Ethernet on it, so you get that performance, which is very actually similar to what you're using with the Thunder Base mm -hmm. that we showed up there. Um, 10 gigabit Ethernet, so you actually can saturate that and get very, speeds very similar to, to Thunderbolt, which, um, so if, if you always have that question, like, can I actually do this with networking? Is it fast enough? Well, just think about that. Like, it, it's, it's 10 gigabit, so that's what Thunderbolt, uh, well, first gen Thunderbolt actually was. So if you can do something with a Thunderbolt drive, you can probably do it with a, an Ethernet, a 10 gig Ethernet system. So, um, I mean, that's, that's totally part of the problem as well. It's, you know, I'm, I'm literally running up against drive speeds on this. Yeah. When you're riding at 60 frames a second at 8K, <laughs> drive speeds and GPU are an issue. Yeah, so um, speed is definitely something we have in our systems. I mean, we, we have a focus on building up the back end within the system. So we don't want to skimp with the drives inside and the configuration. So you immediately start getting like a reduction in speed as soon as you have multiple people tackling it. We didn't want that to happen. We wanted to build something that was so powerful behind the scenes that you could have multiple editors coming in and doing things at the same time and, and it, would, it would just work. You'd have same fast speeds that, that you would expect as, as if you were just accessing it independently. So um, size-wise, I mean, you're talking like how many gigs per minute was it? Well, it's not Lytro. Did anybody see the Lytro set up today or the Cadillac camera? 100 gigs, what is it, 100 gigs a second with a mini fridge to, to store it just while you're shooting? Yeah. Pretty cool, pretty that's, cool. That's just nuts. So I'm not shooting that, but we're, we're close yeah. to it. And it'll just get worse. Yeah. So um, scalability is a key, and uh, we can scale up into the petabytes. Uh, I mentioned ZFS. I'm not going to bore you with all the technical details right now, but I believe it originally stood for Zettabyte file system. So um, What's a Zettabyte? Oh, God, is that... No, like a yeah. put me on the spot. Man. No, no worries. We'll figure it out in a bit. I can tell you what a petabyte is. But there you go, right? So ex expansion into petabytes and theoretically even zettabytes is actually possible with this file system. So That's it's insane. it's kind of like future proofing yourself. Um, and because we're we're kind of using open, well, we are using open source foundations within our system because we don't want to lock you into some proprietary RAID format, right? So. We're basing this, uh, the ZFS off of the OpenZFS project, which is cool because you can take those drives. So if you mentioned if something happens, um, so maybe like a fire happens in the something I mean, location I assume you're I would keep it near yeah. wetsuits. Yeah. So like maybe the power supply fries on a system because it got water splashed on it. You can take those drives out and move them into another system. It wouldn't even have to be ours at that point. Hopefully it is ours. But um, you could plug them in, and it would work. As long as that system can work with ZFS, you're cool. So um, doing some cool stuff. And I'll, I'll stop there before I get into really techy, geeky stuff. Sounds amazing. So. so the next thing I have, we have about five minutes left. Does anybody have any questions about VR capture or VR in general or if you like my cat Lola? <laughs> I like the cat video. I can't hear a word you're saying. Okay, that's a great question. Um, he just asked what we're doing for stitching. So stitching, that's an interesting question. I don't think there's just one answer. There's a number of solutions. I personally prefer Nuke, and the house that I work with prefers Nuke as well. That's the molecule. But, you know, I personally use Autopano as well, a lot in the field. It's very quick. It's very easy. I can render quickly if I'm on my little machine 
on a boat and I need to make sure that I got the shot so I don't have to go down again, I'll do that, absolutely, instead of setting up a, new, a nuke node tree or something. But there's a number, of the, a number of other solutions in the same way that I think in VR, there isn't just one camera solution. I tend to treat cameras like lenses. There's a different post solution for each job. I've seen some amazing stitching come out, just come out of After Effects, actually. I've seen some amazing solutions come out. I saw one of the best stereo renders I've ever seen in my life last night, just straight out of PT GUI which blew my mind. I felt that was like painting the Sistine Chapel with like a toothbrush, but it looked great. So I, it's whatever works best for you. Um, Nuke does allow for large scale renders and a number of other factors that we found works best for this project. That's a good question. How do you hide it? So we use a Tetra mic, uh, which is an ambisonic microphone, um, along with your traditional labs that you hide. There is no boom, which boom, which always really, really annoys all of my sound guys. Um, it's a small little Tetra mic that's mounted below the camera. Um, we use that. I have the best sound team in the world, in my opinion, um, who just do stuff that completely blows my mind. Um, Tim Gadamer is incredible, and he specializes sound in ways that I. I mean, it's not just the sound guy thing where they put on the headphones and you're like, what, I don't get it. And they're like, dude, it's so amazing. And then you're like, what? It's not that, it's actually, it's actually different and it's amazing. But yeah, so you hide, you hide it, you just don't, you don't have it. There's no boom. A lot of ADR. Anybody else? Um, that, well, there's, yeah, you absolutely can. So he just asked if, if I can hide under the camera. Um, it does present a larger target to paint out, and it becomes way more annoying to get rid of a dude hiding underneath, underneath the camera. However, there are some instances where either not hiding under the camera means you can't get the shot, or it actually becomes more dangerous to, like, particularly around wild animals. I did, in that shark footage shot you saw there, we, uh, I planted the camera, and ran off and hid behind a rock, um, not realizing that some very large sharks had appeared and started to come out to get my rig and realized that there was a very, very large shark right in front of my face. Um, so I probably should have stayed closer and stayed with an eye line, but it's just, a, I mean, I guess the, the answer for that is, what is your tolerance to painting out? If you are totally cool with painting out everything. You could stand in the shot and direct standing next to them. There are some VR solutions like Ozo that pr provide immediate playback. Um, some people just like being there and hiding under the tripod. That was so that it wouldn't get stolen. So you're saying is it possible to see it live? That depends on the camera rig. So, it totally, it totally is possible to see it live. It just really depends upon the camera rig. There are a number of different solutions that provide automatic feedback. Um, the problem is it's, it's not always exactly the way your final output will be, so it's, it's difficult to judge. And when you do sh use a live stitcher, you need to be very aware of that may not be what it's ultimately going to be like. Um, so yes, it is, it is possible. The Ozo right now, I just, I just came from directing a three-camera Ozo shoot where live stitching or live switching in the field and live stitching, stereo, spatialized, VR, 360. Uh, it's a three camera shoot. One of the cameras is up on a jib. Um, it's pretty awesome, actually. It was really cool. And um, it's spatialized sound as well, all live, right away. You can put a headset on. I was directing the show, watching three monitor feeds, as well as putting, my, putting a Samsung Galaxy Gear on my face off and on. If you cover the ports inside, you can take it off without having it uh, load. Minute left. I mean, personally, that, that means you've got a big black hole at the top and bottom. Um, you could do that if you want to. Sounds cool. I mean, I, I've done stuff where I've, I've framed things, certainly. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's your preference. There's no, like, to put rules on this medium that's fairly young, or at least in its infancy now, in terms of how much of adoption is going on, I think it's foolish. Thank you. So that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm really happy Thank to be you. here.